Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The bodies of two elderly women were switched by a local funeral home last fall. That's according to lawsuits that were filed by the women's families. The suit alleges that the funeral home sent the bodies to each other's viewing last November. Paul Venemer reports that the suit claims the mix-up resulted in one of the women's bodies being dug up after it had been buried in the wrong grave. Mission Park funeral chapels and cemeteries are at the center of this case. The women are identified in the lawsuit as 85-year-old Catalina Cervantes and 88-year-old Mary Lou Salinas. The two died just 10 days apart last November, and their funerals were handled by Mission Park. This case is filed, and um, we're kind of restricted. Attorney Mark Greenwald represents the family of Mary Lou Salinas. Attorney Alan Katzman has been retained by the family of Catalina Cervantes. Both attorneys say that since litigation is pending, they cannot discuss specifics of the cases. In every funeral home case that I've handled, uh, the trauma that's inflicted on the family is uh, always severe, horrific, and lingering. In this case, the lawsuit claims one of the bodies had to be exhumed and re-identified by the family. Again, without discussing these cases specifically, that's a traumatic experience, according to the attorney for the Salinas family. All clients that I've had are horrified. They just don't know what to do, as if they're in a a different universe. The lawsuit claims that the funeral home admitted they made a mistake and promised to make it right. There are no redos on funerals. There is only one chance to do it right. A statement from MPII Incorporated calls the family's attorneys publicity seeking contingent fee lawyers and said the lawsuit is an attempt to exploit two separate families. The lawsuit is seeking damages in excess of $1 million. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. More than 2 million COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Texas so far. 370,000 people have been fully vaccinated. But a top state health official says things could be better. Garrett Berger has the latest on what's next for the vaccine rollout. Obviously, we're having some issues with that story. Hope to get to it a little bit later in this show. Oh, now I'm told we have it. Here's Garrett's story. DSHS Associate Commissioner and Chairwoman of the state's expert vaccine allocation panel, Imelda Garcia, says Texas is off to a strong start with vaccinations. We have 2 million doses administered and 1 in six, uh, 65 and older having received their first dose. But even if you're eligible to receive the vaccine, it can be difficult to get in to get it. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Garcia says reoccurring first dose vaccine allocations for Texas are supposed to go up next week from about 333,000 to 385. Plus, Texas is getting back about 126,000 doses it had to set aside for a program to vaccinate long-term care facilities. So what we're trying to do with this one-time supply of extra doses next week is to allocate them to some of the suburban counties to help get them back on par. A lot of people out there wondering, when is my chance to get the shot? Garcia says they're still working on who will be eligible next, when will be determined in large part by vaccine supply. We do expect that there will be another blended transition where we would have one B and one B C or phase two, you know, eligible next. Um, but that's something that we're talking through. The state's continuing to focus on big hubs right now. When they pivot back to a broad distribution strategy will also rely a lot on supply. You'll notice in week eight allocations that we have started increasing vaccine going to uh, pharmacies and other providers as well. Gary Berger, KSAT 12 News. Glad we got that story in. If you're looking to get the COVID-19 vaccine, your next opportunity will be with WellMed. This Saturday, their phone line will open again for appointments beginning on February 1st. The phone number on your screen, 833-968-1745. That line will be open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. again on Saturday until the slots are filled. WellMed expecting 9,000 doses. Metro Health and University Health have slots full but they are scheduling weeks ahead for details on all of this and more. Head to our website at ksat.com. It is one of the biggest COVID vaccine questions. Should pregnant women get it? 
The American Academy of Obstetrics and Gynecology is recommending that all pregnant women get vaccinated, but the World Health Organization now says not so fast. Ursula Perry explains why there's a difference of opinion here and why American doctors believe they're right to recommend. The mixed messages started when the World Health Organization this week said this. WHO recommends not to use mRNA 1273 in pregnancy unless the benefit of vaccinating a pregnant woman outweighs the potential vaccine risks. The reasoning? Doctors say it's just a matter of who got into the first clinical trials where we have a total now of over 35,000 individuals. It was all done in a healthy, quote unquote, healthy population. None of the individuals who were in those trials were pregnant. As a result, those early clinical trials of Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines failed to include pregnant and breastfeeding women. So there's no safety data available. In the meantime, Dr. Morara says what we do know, though, should encourage any pregnant or breastfeeding mom to get in line for a vaccine. The evidence to date shows is that compared to women who are not pregnant, they are at higher risk for requiring IC intensive care unit admission, um, mechanical ventilation, and, and death. Um, it, although this is a rare occasion. The vaccine makers say that they want to establish registries to follow pregnant women and their children in order to find out how they fare after the vaccine. As well, Pfizer does plan to have an actual maternal vaccine study giving moms and the WHO the information they need in order to make that recommendation. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Our hour-long special on the COVID-19 vaccines is online right now. That's where we break down all the misinformation that's out there and provide fact and science-based information about the vaccines that are on the market now, hoping to end this COVID-19 pandemic. You can watch that full special on our website at ksap.com. A third person arrested in connection with a brutal beating of a man outside of a northeast side strip club back on January 7th. 27 year old Jonathan Pena was taken into custody today by the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force. He is charged with aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury. Back on January 15th, Zachary Wytrek and Aurelio Elizondo Jr. were also arrested. All three accused of stripping the man naked and then beating him up. The incident also caught on camera where Pena is seen allegedly punching the victim in the face, knocking him to the ground. A big challenge amid this pandemic, keeping your distance, but also staying connected to the services that you need. It's a big reason why telehealth has gotten more popular over the last year. A UTSA project is helping autism therapy move in that direction by training clinicians. Tiffany Huerta shares the story of a mother who says it's been an invaluable help to her daughter throughout COVID. Um, once COVID hit, we had to kind of figure out what would work best for her. Nita Diaz says her five-year-old daughter, Alexa, has autism spectrum disorder and has been receiving services from the Autism Treatment Center for two years. Her lessons moved to online amid the pandemic. Um, they gave me the option to do telehealth because I didn't want her to regress with all the progress that she had already had. So we decided to do it. Dia says they had never done telehealth before. My daughter's nonverbal. So one thing for me was very important um, to know if she knew certain objects. Dia says telehealth worked for them. So being able to actually do telehealth and sit down with her and do like a matching type game, she was able to show me all the words that she actually didn't know. Good job. Last year, clinicians at the Autism Treatment Center were trained on telehealth by UTSA faculty from the Department of Educational Psychology. One of the things we've been investigating since 2013 really was telehealth. Leslie Neely, Associate Professor of Educational Psychology at UTSA, says telehealth is crucial in keeping children on track during the pandemic. I think what would have happened is a lot of those treatment gains, especially for these children who uh, need these additional services, it, we really would have seen that decrease in everything that they've learned, their social communication strategies, um, increase in their problem behavior, reduction, and just all of these huge strides they've made already. Sorry. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Good job, baby. It is a question we hear a lot. Now that it's tax time, if I worked at home most of last year, can I deduct my expenses? Maybe you bought a new desk, a computer, faster internet, maybe a printer, or a ring light. 
you know, for yep. live shots from your house. <laughs> yep. You can write them <laughs> off on your federal tax. Can you write them off on your federal income taxes? Unfortunately, if you are an employee only, that is not something you can deduct. Sorry, Myra. Oh. If you are a W-2 employee, you cannot deduct those. The tax reforms a couple of years ago erased those itemized deductions in favor of a larger standard deduction. However, if you are self-employed or you work as an independent contractor or freelancer, you may still be able to deduct qualified expenses. It can get a bit complicated, so check with your tax preparer for IRS guidelines. As for most other employees, your best option may be to ask your employer about any reimbursements. Taxes? Complicated? No. I wasn't sure what a ring light was until the pandemic. <laughs> Same. I did not well, know what that was. I, I'm shocked because you're such an influencer. You're, you're all <laughs> over social media. Usually, I'm usually cutting edge, but <laughs> I mean, I always see your posts of you giving ducky face. <laughs> I Actually, I do the cicada. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we only made it into the 50s for high temperatures around town and take a look at our pollen count. Mount Cedar high again with a count of about 3,000 mold on the low end. Right now we're in the 50s and tonight we'll be down in the upper 30s but above freezing. We'll talk more about it and break it down into detail coming right up. Tonight we are reporting 1,752 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 166,022 since the pandemic began. Our seven-day rolling average is down slightly from yesterday to 1,459. I'm very sad to report that we do have 20 new deaths to report tonight, all occurred within the last 14 days. That brings our total number of deaths to 2,027. Please join our entire community in praying for their loved ones this evening. And remember that every single one of these numbers that we report to you every night is a mother, a father, a daughter, a, a son, a brother, a sister, someone who is very missed. So please keep them in your prayers. We are seeing some positive developments in our hospitals tonight. We are down one, to 1,276 patients in our local hospitals. That's down 65 from yesterday, so a big, big drop there. Uh, there were also a lower number of new admissions over the last 24 hours, 132. 397 people are in intensive care with COVID and 249 on ventilators. Let me turn it now to just uh, to Commissioner Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. And um, yeah, I guess a little bit of good good uh, trending at least. We, we don't. I guess we don't want to call it a trend quite yet, but it look, looks like the hospital numbers are down a little bit. So that's good news for our community. But continue your due diligence. I did want to make. Um, with the time I've got, just a couple mentions of uh, folks. Uh, you mentioned, Mayor, that we lost 20 more members of our community. Um, I know this is probably not in the, in the tally quite yet, but we did lose a Bear County uh, family member and employee, Roman Gonzalez, who was 59, worked in our fleet maintenance department, six-year employee of, of the department. I think that now brings uh, to six the number of county employees we've lost uh, to this deadly virus. So uh, we want to keep Roman and his family in, in our thoughts and prayers. Um, the other person I wanted to mention, of course, everyone's important, but I had a, a good friend, um, Bill Dubell, who passed away this week from complications from COVID. Um, Bill was 95. Um, and, and Mayor, you may remember, um, I think you were there when we dedicated uh, Jane Dubell Park off Callahan. This is uh, Jane's husband who passed away, um, a veteran, a rancher, just a good, decent man uh, we lost this week. Um, and probably both um, the most um, inspiring but also the most heartbreaking part was he was married to Jane for 74 years, rarely left her side. Um, and unfortunately, you know, she couldn't be by his side in his in his last few days. So. Um, you know, a reminder again to everyone, no matter your age, um, this virus doesn't discriminate and we're losing good people every day. So let's keep uh, Jane and the DuBell family in our prayers. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for that, um, Commissioner. And, and we do uh, want to send our condolences to the DuBells and all the family and community around them that uh, have loved them over the years and who they loved back. Um, also want to let you know that uh, there have been several calls with state and uh, federal health officials over the last several days with mayors uh, in Texas and across the country 
We are all pushing the same message, which is that we need more vaccine doses. So we want to thank you. I know this has been a very frustrating process, but the patience that you're demonstrating, allowing those vaccines to come in and get out to the community that needs them is, is very important right now. We're going to work uh, every single day to bring more vaccines to our community, and we'll keep, keep you posted along the way. We also want to remind you that if you are struggling through this pandemic, paying rent or mortgage, there is an emergency housing assistance program for you. you can get more information. I know when we talked to the mayor on Tuesday, he talked about the fact that he was on a conference call with the White House where they were talking about vaccines. There he mentioned the fact that mayors from around the country, certainly around the state, are talking to both state officials and federal officials with the simple message we need more vaccine doses and certainly the frustration with people trying to get in for one of those doses has been uh, very visible and certainly we're getting a lot of calls as well on what's the best way to do it. Yeah, we hear that frustration and confusion every single day when it comes to the new numbers today, perhaps the most eye opening one. 20 new deaths reported over the last two weeks from COVID-19. Uh, the county commission there mentioning two, um, just two of the victims of this illness in our community. Some good news when it comes to the hospitalization numbers. Those continue to go downward. 1,276 people in the hospital and 1,752 new cases confirmed today. And the seven day, 24 hour average continues to go down as well, which is good news. All right, let's switch over to the weather department right now. And today was cold. Did we get a freeze last night? Did it get below 32? Not in San Antonio. Okay. In the hill country, we actually dipped down into the upper 20s in many locations. But officially in San Antonio, we were just shy of a freeze by about four degrees. So it was close. And tonight's going to be another cold night. But I think even the hill country, for the most part, will be avoiding a freeze. Let's take a look at the readings across the state. By and large, 50s, still hanging on to some 60s. El Paso included at 62. Laredo stands out at 66, but those are some of the exceptions. 54 now in San Antonio. Gonzalez, New Braunfels, 56, and as cool as 50 in Rock Springs. So by tomorrow morning, some mid 30s in the Hill Country. There will be some nooks and crannies of the Hill Country that are typically cooler neighborhoods that will probably hit freezing, but I think the official reporting stations, most areas will be about three, four degrees above the freezing point here in San Antonio, 39 to start the day tomorrow. So you'll want your jacket again tomorrow morning, but the afternoon will be a little bit warmer today. We only made it to 57 tomorrow. We'll make it into the 60s, mid 60s. So back to average for this time of year, even up to 68 Lavernia and Elmendorf, 64 Leon Springs. Timberwood Park about 64. I'd say Canyon Lake about 64 degrees as well. So we've got some high clouds and mid clouds that have been coming off the Pacific Ocean. Just some clouds that give us a little variety to our sky and some pleasant sunrises and sunsets. But the real moisture that's on the West Coast, that disturbance is going to be tracking eastward. It's going to bring a lot of moisture with it but it's going to be passing to the north of us, unfortunately. So a dry day tomorrow, but you'll notice a decent amount of clouds in the sky. 39 in the morning. By the noon hour, we're at 58 in the mid 60s for the high uh, south southeasterly wind at 5 to 15. Saturday is going to be even warmer well into the 70s. However, Saturday morning is going to be rather damp. We'll have some drizzle, a few passing sprinkles, but probably only adding up to a few hundredths of an inch. Then we clear out for Saturday afternoon and even Sunday's looking very sunny near 70. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, Greg uh, talked to us about it at five o'clock. Didn't give us details, but that pop got a special birthday present. Is that what you said? He did. He received the COVID vaccine today. Remember, he is eligible because today is his 72nd birthday. So when we come back, it's also part of an NBA wide campaign about getting people to get vaccinated. We'll have more on that when we come back. And how about Keldon Johnson's standout play coming back? San Antonio Spurs announced today that head coach Greg Popovich has received a COVID vaccine shot. He is eligible since, after all, today is Pop's 72nd birthday. The NBA also shared the event with his public service announcement videos part of their COVID campaign of Pop receiving his shot and then asking others to do the same when they are eligible. I'm going to get the COVID vaccine shot. It'll keep me safe, keep my family safe, keep other people safe. Wearing masks is important, and to get the vaccine does give you an added level of assurance. That's done. I didn't even feel it. Science-wise, it's a no-brainer. 
It's the right thing to do so we can all get on track again. Let's do this together. To learn more, visit cdc.gov. Pop is the oldest coach in the NBA and is the longest tenured coach at all of major sports. He's now in his 25th season as a head coach of the Spurs. Prior to the game against the Celtics last night, veteran Rodriguez was asked if Pop serves as a role model for what he and his teammates would like to be later in life. Yeah, did you see that, 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 that picture of him jumping? Yeah. He's looked higher than some of the players on the team, so um, <laughs> that's something I want to do at 72, I guess. But, you know, like I said, he comes in here, he gets his workouts in, he, he takes he – takes, his health serious and he he's had a lot of reasons to so you know and that, and you know he's still out here he's still you know chipper and doing what he does so you know that that that's definitely something i can look forward to you know trying to trying to do when i get that age the spurs getting their 10th win of the season last night against one of the beasts of the east the boston celtics part of those 10 wins have also been road victories over two of the top teams in the western conference the clippers and the lakers and during this run one of the big surprises has been the play of keldon johnson just his second season with the spurs he had 18 points last night to go along with his 10 rebounds and 31 minutes of action that's his fifth double double of the season only two other spurs have more double doubles in their first 35 games and that is david robinson with 25 tim duncan with 20 and he was part of the spurs rally in the fourth quarter to beat boston last night they included this wicked crossover and slam of the 110 106 victory you know we got to give kudos to Kelvin. um we go out there and play against you know um a, a, a ape he gonna go out there and compete with the same energy so um it's great um when you take on them challenges and, and on both ends uh we know any, any given night uh, anybody can be beat and anybody can beat us so we feel like that uh we just gotta come out ready to play you know I feel like every game Every game is different. You know, no no two games are the same. So uh, we just come out ready to compete, man. You know, to me, he's been the biggest surprise this season for the Spurs. Tip off tomorrow night against Denver when they continue their homestand at 730. The UTSA Roadrunners have fired Tyrone Nix as their defensive coordinator. That announcement made today saying the team will not renew his contract that ends February the 15th. According to the statement released by the school, the decision is based on an overall evaluation, which included the outcome of an internal investigation was initiated in November, as well as other factors. He had been placed on administration leave with the announcement coming at halftime of the Roadrunners game against UTEP on November the 14th. Coming up tonight, more about the Spurs and DeJounte Murray. Now he is Blossom into one of the go-to guys. Just one of the young guns the Spurs have. Awesome to watch. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. We turn now to the coronavirus emergency. Health officials sounding the alarm about new variants appearing across the nation, most recently one from South Africa. The White House trying to vaccinate Americans as quickly as possible, but warning there is a long road ahead. ABC's Rena Roy with the latest. It's a race against the clock to vaccinate Americans as mysterious new variants pop up in more than half the country. They're more transmissible, which can lead to increased number of cases and increased stress on our already taxed healthcare system. Health officials in South Carolina announcing the nation's first known cases of the South African variant, saying two people with no travel history in different parts of the state have contracted it. Early data shows vaccines will work against the mutation, but Dr. Anthony Fauci told ABC's Good Morning America drug makers are looking into booster shots. The one in South Africa, George, troubles me. Yeah, we're not taking any chances. And the CDC says at least 315 cases of the UK variant, believed to be more transmissible and possibly more dangerous, have been confirmed in the U.S. Meantime, the current limited supply of vaccine doses is causing concern across the U.S. These Oregon Health Department workers making the best of things in a snowstorm Tuesday, vaccinating drivers stuck in the snow with them when they realized the doses they had were close to expiring. While cases and hospitalizations are going down for now, deaths are still on the rise. The U.S. averaging nearly 3,300 COVID-19 related fatalities every day, according to Johns Hopkins University. Madeline McMahon, a frontline nurse in North Carolina, spent months caring for patients battling the virus. Then she contracted it herself and never recovered. She loved the people there. She loved the small community. She loved to care for the, the local people. And back to those variants, scientists say once a mutation is detected, it's likely already pretty widespread. But the good news is that it won't take too much time if the vaccines do, in fact, need to be updated to protect against the variants. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. 
The rate of traffic deaths is on the rise amid COVID-19 restrictions as drivers speed up on more open roads. That death rate climbed in the first half of 2020. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, when the pandemic substantially reduced traffic, the rate of fatalities per miles driven spiked 18%. Research shows even small speed increases caused much deadlier outcomes in crashes. An easily survivable crash at 40 miles per hour can be fatal at 50 miles per hour. That's according to a study by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety. The Miami Heat will screen fans using COVID-19 detection dogs ahead of Thursday's game against the LA Clippers. The dogs will screen ticket holders upon arrival at American Airlines Arena. It'll be the first time in months that the team has had fans in the stands. According to a video posted on the team's website, the virus sniffing pups will walk past each fan. If the canine sits, that means it detects the virus and the person and their party will not be allowed inside. Being vaccinated will not trigger a dog to sit. By the way, studies all over the world have indicated that dogs may be trained to detect COVID-19. On your screen right now, a live look at the SAPD honor procession for Officer Anofre Serna. He passed away last week at the age of 60. The procession began at the central substation off of South Frio, traveling through downtown. Serna worked for SAPD and before that for the Bear County Sheriff's Office, serving for more than 30 years. We'll be right back. Is separating some of the facts from the fear that is out there when it comes to COVID-19, the vaccines, some of the things we're seeing. As usual, on Thursday, we are joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron, an infectious disease doctor from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, always great to see you. I, I want to start off a lot of talk about the variants and just how much more infectious they are, how much more easily spread they seem to be than the first strain of COVID-19. Are you right. are you concerned about that? And do you think that the vaccines can cover these variants? Yes. So I am very concerned. You know, people have heard about the UK variant, the South Africa variant and the Brazil variant. Um, let me tell you the good news first. The good news is that it looks like our vaccines are still going to cover these. And it also looks like we can maybe develop boosters to make sure that we're fully covered. But here's the problem. We're in a race right now because um, it's going to take a long time for us to get everybody immunized. And even though we are all out, everybody's at these vaccine hubs is doing a great job and we're all out. But there's just so many people we can vaccinate every day. And so we're not going to have herd immunity before the possibility of these more infectious variants coming to San Antonio. And we know that um, they've been found in Houston, and we, we believe that they're here. And so it's really important that we continue with those three W's of wearing a mask, washing our hands, and watching our distance. I wish I didn't have to be saying this to you in January 2021 as we're rejoicing about the vaccine. But the truth of the matter is these are more infectious, and therefore they can spread more rapidly. And if we're not careful, if we let our guard down, we could be in for a world of hurt. I've been reading because some of these variants seem to be more easily transmissible. Double masking, wearing two masks is a good idea. Has that shown to be effective against these variants? No, I don't think double masking is the answer. It's the three W's. It's doing all of those practices and making sure you have a high quality mask. And by that, I mean at least a double layer, right? It needs to not just be a single layer of stretchy material. You have to have two layers and some of them have three, which is probably better than two, but there's nobody ever, nobody has ever done a study that showed that three, you know, more masks is, are better. And I would say, I'd remind people that letting your mask slip down below your nose is totally ineffective. It's like you're not wearing a mask at all. And I would tell, remind everybody that if your mask has a big gap here on the side, um, that that's a problem and you either need to work on how it's fitting or you know, sometimes people use a second mask for that. So if you're using your second mask to close the gap on the side, that's a good thing. But you don't have to have two masks to be safe. You just have to have a good mask. As always, we get a lot of viewer questions for you, doctor. And this one is, this person says, I'm a resident of Denton County, Texas, but I'm living in San Antonio to take care of my mother who is in home hospice. 
Am I eligible for a vaccine in Bear County? She says the Alamo Dome, for example. Yes, we are not restricting people's vaccination based on their county in Texas. So you can get vaccinated in Bear County. Is it important that they are there, that they, they're in Bear County long enough, though, to get the second dose as well? Yes, you really need to come back to the place where you were first vaccinated. Um, I imagine that as time goes on, we're going to get more sophisticated, but it's um, important for completeness and for accuracy that people get vaccinated the second vaccine in the place where they got their first vaccine. That is good to note. We've gotten a lot of questions too about people who have had COVID. We talked last week about what if you get COVID in between the first and right. second dose, but what if you have just had COVID before, how long should you wait before getting that first dose of the vaccine? So the answer is you have to wait until you're no longer infectious to other people. And so we can review that, right? You get a COVID diagnosis, either symptomatic or asymptomatic. You need at least 10 days of isolation plus one full 24 hour period with no fever without taking any fever lowering medicines. That's the definition of how long you're infectious, whether you have symptoms or you don't have symptoms. You must get out of that infectious period. And when you are no longer infectious, you may get vaccinated. Could you wait longer? Yes, you could. And you wouldn't want to wait more than 90 days after your COVID infection because that's the time point at which we've documented true reinfections. So we believe that your immunity is going to last a good long while but we know that in some people, the immunity doesn't seem to last longer than 90 days. So we don't want you to wait more than 90 days, but you can get it as soon as you're no longer infectious to other people. I want to get to another viewer question. I live in an apartment community. Can I catch COVID-19 through air conditioning, heating, air vents in my apartment and or building? Are droplets carried through air vents? And how can residents protect themselves in apartment living? So... We know that this is predominantly transmitted through droplets and droplets are not usually transmitted through the air circulation of apartment buildings. There have been some instances where this has been reported and it would have to be a very special circumstance. We think that really good air exchange is a good idea. And we also know that in uh, large buildings where there are congregate settings, for example, the Bear County Jail. Um, we have in recommended the installation of ultraviolet light to um, basically sterilize the air as it's circulating around. That is not something that's practical for the average person who lives in an apartment. But I think it is important for landlords and anyone who's responsible for building maintenance to look at the air exchange, make sure that they are maximizing the number of air exchanges per hour that they possibly can with the systems that they have. And in some locations, for example, churches, synagogues, and even some restaurants, people are installing these special UV light treatment systems that help to disinfect the air. Dr. Bergren, as always, thanks for providing some clarity. Thanks to the viewers we had who submitted questions as well. It really helps to clear up some confusion that is still out there 10 months into this pandemic. Thanks for your time. You're most welcome. We'll be right back. Beautiful day out there, but also a reminder that it is still winter. Yes, <laughs> yes. A little bit of a, a chill. Definitely a today. reminder. Yeah, today was a reminder, especially in the hill country where we dipped down into the 20s. Yes, Kerrville 29, the low Fredericksburg. They started their day at 28 degrees, even Rock Springs 32 for the low. Del Rio, a morning temperature of 35, and that was actually a degree cooler than San Antonio. So we felt the chill this morning, even below freezing in some parts of our area, mainly in the hill country. It's going to be another cold night tonight, but not as cold. Let's talk about temperatures and take a good look at our beautiful sunset this evening. Along with our almanac data, we started at 36 in San Antonio and look at that. We only made it to 57 for the high temperature. The average is 64 to put that in perspective. Tomorrow will be back to average across the state, largely in the 50s. 
Laredo stands out at 66, along with Brownsville at 64. Elsewhere, we're mostly in the 50s. Hondo 55, New Braunfels 56, Kerrville now at 51, and Carrizo Springs at 55. So let's fast forward to tomorrow morning. We typically hit our low temperature a little before sunrise, and I think that's going to be in the upper 30s, anywhere along and north of Highway 90. You go south of Highway 90, and we'll probably be in the 40s. And I even think most of the hill country will avoid a freeze by about three to five degrees. Downtown San Antonio, about 40 tomorrow morning. Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, 37, along with Castroville, Lavernia, Elmendorf, La Soya, about 41 in the morning. So jacket weather, but not as cold as what we had earlier today. Then by the afternoon, we get well into the 60s. We're looking at mid 60s for most of us, which is close to average for this time of year. Now notice how temperatures really jump into Saturday. We're back well into the 70s, and I think south of San Antonio, 80 degrees. So 77 is what we're expecting in town on Saturday, but it's going to come with some variable conditions. So let's talk about it. First of all, we had those nice clouds that you saw in the time lapse. Coming in off the Pacific, good mid and upper level clouds, some moisture aloft that's been giving us that variety to our sky, just nothing in terms of moisture. We can't squeeze any raindrops out of these kinds of clouds. The real moisture is still along this atmospheric river and big disturbance that's over the West Coast. I mean, just pummeling California, especially the higher elevations with snow. I mean, on the order of many feet of snow with that. Well, this disturbance, it's going to be pretty potent as it drops farther to the east into the Rockies, good for the ski resorts. We've had a tough snow year from New Mexico all the way into Montana. And it's going to move into the Midwest, but keep its moisture far north of us. Plenty of moisture with it, a lot of precipitation. Here, we're looking at a little bit of drizzle on Saturday. So it's still an active pattern with some potent systems. They're just not hitting us. So tomorrow we'll start the day at 39 degrees by noon near 60, then a high temperature of 65 south southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15. We get into Saturday. It's going to be a damp morning. The fog drizzle dampness, a few sprinkles, but only adding up to maybe a few hundredths of an inch. However, Saturday afternoon, I think by 1 2 p.m. We're on full sunshine, 77 Sunday, sunny and right near 70 degrees for the high temperature. Also, you'll notice a bit of a breeze throughout the weekend. It will be shifting in its direction, but you will be noticing that breeze as well. All right, I'm coming back. Don't worry, I'm coming. Here I come. I'm coming. It was a busy weekend, baby. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Sunday. It's a good thing I've got a television in my garage because I had football on and I got busy. I'm riding this momentum that I had from the Christmas ornament giveaway where I just crushed it, right? Tried to bring happiness to more people. We've had a tough 2020, trying to make 2021 even better. And I thought, let's just keep that going. So I've got these. I still have to put the finishing touches on them and then, of course, get, make the corresponding thermometers. But this was a big step. And I know Santa Jim has another pile about this big as well. That's going to be done for me shortly. So let's just say 2021 is off to a very promising start thermometer-wise. So good news for all. Oh, oh, oh. 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 I'm glad the thermometer's not on there yet. <laughs> Good thing it's solid oak, baby. White oak right there. All right, so let's, we have a winner this week, actually, of a completed homemade thermometer. I'm not going to set that on top, that's for sure. All right, so Terry Brown, the winner of this week's homemade thermometer. By the way, you can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. And I hope to have a slew of these to be able to fulfill more winners this year. It's going to be a record breaker. <laughs> it's too bad you're a little low key about these thermometers. You I don't know. seem excited or, you yeah. know, yeah, just a, a touch more enthusiasm. So here's what I love about them. I mean, every part is handmade except for the laser engraving from blowing the glass to calibrating to making the backboard. I mean, I just love it. It's great. Oh, Steve, he just ignores us and goes back. To I know he's first. he's excitable. That's fine. We'll be right back. <laughs> Call me traditional. <laughs> Got time for a quick buzz. The Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth, Minnesota, opening a pandemic friendly bar made of ice. It's called the Burr Garden, a play on the term beer garden. Aha. It promotes social distancing since it's set up outside. Despite the frigid temperatures, it features ice bars 
with high top tables made entirely of ice. There will be six fire pits to keep people from getting too chilly. Not enough to keep the ice from melting, I hope. An aquarium spokesman says it also has a great view of Lake Superior. For people who really need a bar experience. Yeah. <laughs> when the new White House administration was sworn in, it came with history making titles for Vice President Kamala Harris and her husband, the second gentleman, Doug Imhoff. Well, now Merriam Webster is recognizing that groundbreaking title. It's defined as, quote, the husband or male partner of a vice president or second in command of a country or jurisdiction, end quote. Emhoff is also the first Jewish spouse of an American vice president. Emhoff tweeted about Miriam Webster's recognition, writing, quote, well, now it's official, end quote. <laughs> That's great. We'll be right back. Jacket weather again tomorrow morning. Upper 30s, then mid-60s by the afternoon. Saturday morning, damp. Drizzle, a few sprinkles, but by the afternoon, a lot of sunshine and well into the 70s as well. Sunday, nothing but sunshine near 70, and that sunny trend continues next week. All right. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for watching the News at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.